Hi, my name is Chris and this is Battle Nonsense. Today we will have a look at the netcode of Star Marine, the first person shooter module of Star Citizen. So as many of you will surely know, Star Citizen is a crowdfunded game which is still in development and the very first version of Star Marine has just been released for testing. So the purpose of this video is to show you the current state of the netcode in Star Marine and to provide feedback that will hopefully help the developers to improve the game and the gameplay experience as the development continues. But before we get to the specifics of this title, we must take a look at a few networking basics, which you need to know in order to understand the results of my tests. The reason why I include this basic information in every video is that I do not want that someone who is new to those netcode analysis videos must watch another video first to understand what the analysis is about. Also, I've noticed that it doesn't really work to tell your viewers to watch another video first which then leads to them drawing the wrong conclusions or they simply do not understand the information which I share in the video. Let's start with the ping. Now, what is that and where does the term come from? If you've seen the movie The Hunt for Red October, then you might remember that scene where Sean Connery gave the order to check the distance to the US submarine with one active sonar ping. The way this works is that your ship sends out an audio signal which then gets reflected by other objects in the water and on your ship you have microphones which then hear that reflection. If you then measure the time between sending the audio signal and receiving the reflection, then you can calculate the distance between you and the object. The ping that we talk about for network connections is pretty much the same thing. Your device sends an ICMP echo request to another network device like a game server, which then sends an ICMP echo reply back to your device. Now, when you measure the time between sending the request and receiving the answer, then this gives us the ping or round trip time of the data. So the ping tells us how long the data has to travel through the copper and fiber optic cables to reach the other device. And the longer it takes the data to get to its destination, the bigger the difference between what we see on our monitor and what the other players see on theirs, which is what we call lag. So when I jump, then this information takes some time to reach the server and then the other client. With short distances between the players, this delay or lag is also very short. But when the distance gets bigger, then the clients have to wait longer until they receive an update on what is going on. So the higher your ping, the more you will lag, which leads to a bad experience. But it's not just the player with the high ping that suffers. Depending on how strong the lag compensation is in a game, the high ping player can also give the low ping player a bad experience. But that is a different topic. So the distance between the client and the server defines how long it takes data to travel between them. However, you can't take a map, draw a line between your home and the location where the server is hosted and then calculate your ping based on that distance because the copper and fiber optic cables take a very different route and the data that you send to the server has to pass through multiple routers before it even reaches the server. So when a router has to forward data, then it always tries to find the best and fastest route. This means that when everything works as it should, then your data will take the shortest route to the game server. However, it can happen that a router either chooses the wrong route or that it has to choose a worse one when the better one is down. Such can then lead to quite big detours for your data, which can result in much higher pings and an increased risk of packet loss since your data might have to pass through many more routers then. So when you always play on the same server and suddenly notice that your ping increased, then this could be caused by the routing. And if this is the case, then you have to call your internet service provider so that they can check their routing tables. If you want to help them to get the issue fixed faster, then you can open the command prompt, type in tracer and the IP of the game server that you have problems with. You will then get a list of all the hops between you and the game server with the pings between you and every of those hops. With that information, it will be much easier for your ISP to track down the issue and fix it. So the length of the route that connects the client to the server defines how long it takes data to travel between them. This means that our lag cannot get lower than the ping since we would have to break the laws of physics to speed up the electrons or photons that are used to communicate with the server. What adds an extra delay on top of the travel time of our data is how frequently we send and receive it. So when we send and receive updates 30 times per second, then there is more time between the updates than when we send and receive 60 updates per second. So by sending and receiving more updates per second, you can decrease the additional delay that is added on top of the travel time of your data. But where's that data coming from? This is where the term tick or simulation rate comes into play, 
which is how many times per second the game processes and produces data. So when you have a tick or simulation rate of 30, then this will cause more delay than when you have a tick rate of 60, which also allows update rates of 60 Hz then. Now, what kind of options do developers have when it comes to providing servers? One solution is that you pay hosters to set up dedicated servers for your games in their data centers to which the players then connect to. This means that your game server is running on powerful hardware, the data center provides enough bandwidth to handle all the players that connect to it, and the players are not able to see each other's IP addresses. At least as long as the game does not use a bad peer-to-peer -peer voice over IP solution. Also, if the developers ensure that all players have more or less the same ping to the game server, then you can avoid that some players have an unfair advantage. The downside of dedicated servers is that if you don't have a game that builds around the idea of having the community run these servers, then the publisher or game studio has to pay for them and they are quite expensive. Another problem is that when you release your game worldwide, then you also need to make sure that you have enough server locations to provide all players with low latency servers. If you don't do that, then you create many hyping players and that is a problem for your entire community, not just the players who don't have servers near them. The other approach is that you simply use the PC or console of one of the players to host the game, which means that he becomes the server. With this solution, the game studio does not have to pay for expensive dedicated servers, which must be available in many different regions. This also allows players in remote regions to play with their local friends at relatively low latency. One of the downsides is that the player who is also the server gets an advantage because he has zero lag, which means that in a first person shooter he will see you before you see him and he can fire at you before you can fire at him. It is also possible for the host to further exploit this by artificially increasing the ping of all the other players, which is called lag switching. And the host also sees the IP addresses of all the other players that connect to him, which is in my opinion quite a big security concern. Then we also have the problem that all players connect to the host through his consumer grade internet connection, when the worst case he could even use Wi-Fi. This frequently results in a lot of lag, packet loss, rubber banding and an unreliable hit registration. But the most frustrating part of such client-hosted matches is that if your host disappears, then the game must choose another player to host the match, which means that the whole game pauses for several seconds until the host migration has finished. So while dedicated servers do not magically provide 100% lag-free connections, they still offer the best possible experience in online multiplayer games. So what does Star Marine use? I was actually worried that it might use client-side hosting for its matches, but as it turns out, both public and private matches will use dedicated servers that are currently hosted by Amazon's cloud service. But while the service has data centers in these locations, Star Marine is currently only using servers that are located in Virginia. And that means that many players outside the United States have to deal with pings of 100 milliseconds or even more, which you can check inside of the scoreboard by pressing the F1 key. Now how about the update rates which have a big impact on the additional delay that is added on top of our data travel time or ping. When we look at the network data from a public match, then we can see that every 33 milliseconds my client receives an update from the server, which means that I receive 30 updates per second. And every 33 milliseconds my client sends an update to the game server, which means that this rate here is also 30 Hz. The same is true for private matches, which means that you will get the same experience in both public and private matches. However, there is something that I noticed when I was looking at the data from Wireshark, and that is that you receive huge amounts of data from the server. The updates are in fact so big that they sometimes get split into three packets, even though I'm not quite sure why they use 1042 bytes as maximum packet size. Besides Titanfall 1, this is actually the first time that I've seen a game receive updates from the game server that were so big that they had to get split into multiple packets. So I think that there's definitely room for improvement here as games like Battlefield, which are far more complex, receive much smaller packets from the server. And that is quite a big deal because you want that as many people as possible play your game, so you have to keep the traffic and the bandwidth requirements as low as possible. So the Star Marine game client sends and receives 30 updates per second, which means that the server will most likely run at a tick rate of 30 Hz. And while I'm happy that they use the same rate for both update directions, I still hope that Star Marine will eventually use 60 Hz, as that will reduce the delays and make the game feel a lot more responsive. 
Now, what effect does this have on the delay that two players experience when they play on the same server? To test this, I use a high-speed camera, two PCs where each of them has its own fiber internet connection, and 144Hz gaming monitors on which the game runs at 144fps, which is the frame rate limit at the moment. To measure the delays between the players, I point my high-speed camera at the monitors and then fire 20 shots with player 2. Inside the high-speed recording, I then look for the frame where I see that player 2 fired his gun, and then I count the frames until I see the gunfire on the monitor of player 1. In addition to this gunfire test, I also did two movement tests. In the first one, player 2 jumps, and I count the frames until I see the player model jump on the monitor of player 1. In the second test, player 2 moves to the side, and then I count the frames until I see his player model move on the monitor of player 1. So, as I said before, the Star Marine game servers are hosted in the USA, which means that my clients had a ping of 107 milliseconds while I was running these tests. This is a slight problem, because when I do this kind of network analysis videos, then my clients usually have a ping of 25 milliseconds to the game server, as all of them use servers hosted in Amsterdam. So I decided to remove that additional delay from the test results to make it easier for you to compare the results from Star Marine to those from the other games that I tested in the past. I know that this is not ideal, but this will have to do for the first test of this game, and I hope that I can run the next tests on a server which is hosted inside of Europe. So if both players had a ping of 25 milliseconds instead of 107 milliseconds to the game server, then the average delay for the gunfire would be 72 milliseconds, which is not bad when compared to other first person shooters. Now, if you played Star Marine, then you were probably shot by players before you even saw them. This is usually where I start to talk about high pings and lag compensation. However, Star Marine seems to have a rather big problem at the moment, because jumping has a delay of 370 milliseconds on average. And the same is true for walking, running and stance changes, which you can see in these examples here. So, as I said in the beginning of this video, Star Marine is in a very early stage of its development, where the developers are still building some of the tools, mechanics and features. This test of its netcode is meant to provide some insight into its current state and share some feedback that the developers can hopefully use to improve the game as the development continues. If you can see past the issues that the first release of Star Marine is suffering from, then there is quite some potential there for a good and entertaining shooter. What I really like is how the game changes when you leave the indoor area, detach from the station and then use your jetpack to flank the enemy team. So I'm definitely looking forward to see what the developers come up with in the next few weeks and months. I hope that you enjoyed this very early netcode analysis of Star Citizen's first person shooter module called Star Marine. And if you like this kind of niche content where I take a look at the inner workings of video games and show you how these affect your experience, then you can help me to cover the costs of this channel by supporting me through Patreon. The link is in the description below. Also, if you want to know what I'm currently working on, then you can follow me on Twitter or Facebook. The links are also in the description of this video. If you enjoyed this video, then please give it a like, subscribe for more and I hope to see you next time. Until then, have a nice day and take care. My name is Chris and this was Battle Nonsense.